Hi, everybody. Again, without further ado, I would like to present you um, Dr. Andrea Bistogi. He's the director of UCLA Core Kidney Health Program and the professor and clinical chief of the Division of Nephrology here at UCLA. Um, Dr. Bistogi, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. I uh, just want to welcome everybody to our chat. This is our monthly program, first of every month, 5 to 6 p.m. PST. Our previous events are recorded. I think that's a question that we're getting quite often is, can we see? And the answer is yes, it's on YouTube. And Christina will put that in the link uh, the, uh, to those. The last one was by Dr. Joanna Shainman, our transplant infectious disease expert. And she spoke on COVID-19 vaccine and a lot more. And she will be coming back in a few months to join us on this chat. Also, what we plan is in the future, we'll bring di different experts. Uh, one is cardiologists that I think is, is very important, cardiovascular disease. We'll also bring diabetes experts. And our, our home crew includes our, our dietitian, Rebecca, and Mark is my co-host for this event, our, our patient advocate from Circle of Core, and, and Dr. Jim Cunningham, who's our, our psychologist. So especially in this day and age, uh, of pandemics, the stress that we have. So with that, uh, I just wanna make sure that we understand this disclaimer. The disclaimer is that the information that we provide today, there's a lot of educational information, but that's only for your information only. So please do not make any changes in your healthcare till you speak to your healthcare provider. So with that, it's, it's my real pleasure and honor and privilege to introduce Mark Coronel. Our, our circle of core uh, patient advocate and an official UCLA ambassador. So Mark, uh, please take it over from here. Thank you, Doc. Thank you for the introduction. Hi, everybody. My name is Mark Coronel. Um, here's a couple of information you guys should really tune into by calling us and feel free to make sure if you guys have any questions that isn't um, asked on the webinar to give us a, a, a shout out on the email by at corekidney at mednet.ucla dot edu or visit our website there's a lot of information that you guys if you don't know you can find there and follow us on facebook.com forward slash core kidney uh next slide please um this is our website this is where me as a patient when i was looking for places to find out what i was going through i i stumbled upon the ucla core kidney website and it, and it's so thorough with all the stages that I had to go through as far as being a patient from pre, during, and post kidney transplant. So if you guys get the chance, please check out this website. It's, it's an amazing, it's amazing insight with what we're going through, information both for donors who consider to be a donor, they can also get that information here. As well as important updates, right? We have these webinars with Dr. Ristogi and the core kidney team every month on the first. So please feel free. I mean, we have one today, but the next coming months, if you have any questions that weren't answered today, remember it's November 1st, December 1st, January 1st, and it's gonna be a consistent thing moving forward. Now our core, our core kidney, our mission, right? And, and this is something that really holds dear to my heart because when you're recently diagnosed or you're going through this, I know you guys can feel lonely, right? You don't, no one can really understand, right? And when I met and reached out to the core kidney group, a lot of things that they inspired in me was hope to never give up, you know? And core is clinical excellence, outreach, research, and education. One of the things I lacked the most when fighting kidney failure was the education component, right? There's, there's clinical trials, there's ways of being a donor, and there's all these informations that you guys can get. Now, the thing is, we are here to supply that information so that you are not left behind. Now, the Green Ribbon Campaign, right, started at UCLA by the Core Kidney Program. Over 31 million people are currently diagnosed with kidney disease, and 26 million are at risk. The best way fighting kidney disease is by spreading awareness and educating people to become advocates for their own health. This is the Green Ribbon Campaign. Several months back, I was actually nominated for the Green Ribbon Campaign because I wasn't really aware of what it was to be an advocate for myself. Dr. Ristogi says, Mark, you have to advocate. And that is one of the things that was really hard for me to do. This is our core kidney team, ladies and gentlemen, and it consists of a wide variety of different people, all walks of life. We have donors and recipients, and maybe when you go onto our website, you can see some of our stories, right? I was diagnosed at 26, got a kidney transplant December 10th, 2019. 
And my goal now is to really raise that awareness so that you're not alone. And with that, I want to bring on Dr. Uh, Jim Cunningham, who will discuss the role of wellness. Thank you, Mark, for the introduction. Um, first of all, let me, uh, I am a, a LMFT PsyD uh, in terms of the jurisdiction of my license. And I'm basically, I'm a psychotherapist. So I deal with presenting clinical issues, um, a myriad of disorders, anorexia, bulimia, otherwise specified. But I think through Dr. Rostogi, uh, I have a steady stream of referrals and have become one of my specialties is PKD. Um, when I first started, I didn't, know, I, I didn't know much about it, but I wanted to go back and talk a little bit about the pandemic and how I think it's very much um, a mimetic view. Uh, it, it kind of mirrors, I think, what people uh, that are in various stages of kidney disease, kidney failure, uh, looking for a donor, you know, all of the variations. So in February of, um, I'm just gonna jog back a little bit here, February of 2020, we started hearing this whole concept of um, COVID-19. Um, I don't think it was coined as a, a, a pandemic as of yet, but as the ensuing weeks went on, I, I, I started conversing with some of my contemporaries and it was something that was very primal. I, would, I, I go to bed very early, but I would get up in the morning and I would have a series of text messages from other psychologists. And some of them were quite alarming. Um, I had one of my friends say, make sure you drink copious amounts of water to neutralize this virus. And at one point, I kind of really started to get a little bit concerned, um, a, a little bit fearful. And as the weeks went on and this thing started to define itself, you know, our lives changed overnight. Uh, what we knew is life um, in terms of social interaction and in terms of um, a work schedule and in terms of structure kind of vanished overnight. So like I initially said, I, I think what people go through in the initial stages of a diagnosis for, kid, for kidney failure is very similar to what we all th went through to the pandemic. So in a lot of ways, the clinical training, all the clinical training that we receive as doctors and uh, MDs and PhDs is something I think you got to take a hold of and kind of assess, I guess, is what I'm trying to get at. I think what it, when, when something like the pandemic hits you on such a primary level, there, there's a profound amount of fear and a profound amount of anxiety. And I can't speak for medical doctors, but somebody who has somewhat of a pretty reasonably good education, I was scared. In addition to that, my phone started ringing off the hook. I have never in my life been so busy. I mean, people seriously were in need of direction and help. And um, I think people lost hope. And that's something that also is kind of, um, congruent when people are first diagnosed. And to bring themselves back, I started pulling, I'm, I'm very psychodynamically oriented. Um, I, I, I think it's important to treat the pathology. I think it's important to go back and try to iron out emotionally and um, intellectually what went on in somebody's childhood if they're trying to deal with an issue. But during the pandemic, I became much more eclectic and I started pulling a great amount of research from postmodern theories. And in a nutshell, what I attempted to do was try to reconnect people with becoming accountable to themselves and for their diets, um, for their emotional well being, for their exercise. I mean, how many times have we heard that people gain COVID 20 or whatever they call it, COVID 30? Well, in, in a lot of ways, I think we needed interventions and I think people needed to be called on their behavior. And frequently in the context of therapy, that's what I would have to do. So 
I would say structure um, in terms of a tool or in terms of a concept is the roadway to hope. I think by taking care of yourself and by eating properly, and I'm, I'm glossing all of this together, but each one of these collectively or separately, I think really kind of grounds you in what you need when you're going, it was a crisis. We were all going through a crisis. And similarly, when people are diagnosed with uh, kidney issues, I think it's the same thing. So what, what I attempt to do in my clinical sessions was with respect to the pandemic is reacquaint people with their resources, um, what they were good at during the course of their life, if they were an athlete, if they did well in school, and those transferable skills, they can start using them in their daily lives now, you know, getting up and taking a walk and trying to eat well and trying to connect with people. And that's the other piece too, that I think was huge with this pandemic people felt disconnected. Um, we didn't know where to go or where to turn. And I think a lot of depressive issues crept in, a profound amount of increase in bipolar too, which does not surprise me. And you know, uh, the personality disorders that people already had were becoming exacerbated. Uh, you know, People who were borderline became a lot more desperate. People who were anorexic uh, kind of clung on to those skills. So. You know, and I think the silver lining in all of this was that it really kind of set everybody back and people needed to wake up and say, okay, we have to ground ourselves. We have to go forward and one day at a time deconstruct whatever this demon is. And I still think we're grappling with it. I think we all believe at this point we're, you know, not where we were in March of 2020. I think we know that hopefully we're going to be okay. But even that word, the way I qualify that, hopefully. So it was a, it was a very desperate time. So basically, that, that's what I attempt to do in my uh, clinical evaluations and my assessments. And um, I, I tried to put people back on track. And um, I wasn't so much about pathologizing as I was just trying to intervene and um, help people with the daily struggles in life. So basically, that's my spiel. Does that make sense, Dr. Rostogi and everybody? Yeah, it, it, it does, Dr. Cunningham. Thank you very much. So there's a couple of comments. Um, one of the reasons uh, Dr. Jim Cunningham is actually a part of our core team, along with, with uh, our dietitian, uh, Rebecca, that you'll be hearing. And then, then we have the patient advocates, and, and we'll be bringing different specialists, like we brought uh, Dr. Shaneman last time, and we'll be bringing different uh, from different uh, specialties, cardiology, diabetes, and stuff. So, anyways, thank you, Dr. Cunningham. Um, if there are more questions coming in, um, we will we will uh, let you know. Hopefully, you'll you'll stick around till the very end. So, Perfect. thank you. Now, moving forward, um, let's get back to some kidney pathology. This is the definition of kidney disease. Uh, we have gone over this uh, several times. Um, how do we define kidney disease? You should know your GFR. Uh, if you don't know your GFR, make sure you do. It should be in your lab. And if you can't find it, Mark went over how to look at labs last time. So he can go over that again at our next visit. But uh, just as you know your cholesterol levels, you should know your GFR. This is your kidney function. And then the other thing that, that we really focus on is amount of protein you're spilling in your urine. So those are the two important tests uh, that, that you should have. Now, causes of chronic kidney disease, diabetes, mellitus, blood pressure, you know, to be, you know, if you have kidney disease and you're being listed as, as hypertension being the cause, you have to be very, very careful because a lot of times hypertension or high blood pressure is actually a consequence of kidney disease rather than, than causing the kidney disease. So be on the lookout for more diagnosis. ADPKD, polycystic kidney disease. Um, I will answer one question right now. And one of the things that we started at UCLA is the nephrogenetics program. And what, what is that? It's looking as if there are genetic causes of kidney disease. And when we look at, and, and we'll do one session on just genetics. But when we look at, at genetics as a cause, there could be a single gene mutation or there could be multiple genes involved. And ADPKD is, is the most common monogenic single gene mutation causing kidney disease. And there are a lot of others too. Uh, we have Lisa Bonebrake from, from Elport Foundation on, on our program as well. And, 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 and Elport is, uh, uh, syndrome is another monogenic cause 
of kidney disease. So UCL is focusing on genetics, and it's not just for diagnostic, but it's also for therapeutics. So that this decade is going to be how you modulate the gene expression to, to get the outcome. And there are a lot of drugs that are coming out to that effect, and there'll be a lot more coming down. But first, we have to get the right diagnosis. And, and for that, uh, we have broad panel testings available now that can help you with that. Uh, one question that came in, uh, for an adopted child with no family medical history information, how does one best diagnose PKD? So if, if there's an adopted child, so I'm, I'm making an assumption that, that you're, you're wondering if the child has, has any, any PKD. So first you should look at, is, are there any telltale signs? Are the kidneys enlarged? Do they have cysts? Are the lab work abnormal? For example, uh, GFR is abnormal or, or they're spilling protein. And if that is a case, then it's, it's, it's a relatively simple, straightforward, broad panel testing. Um, you test up to 400 genes in, and they don't even have to draw blood. They can do the saliva testing. But that's what I would go with in, in, in that case if you're concerned about uh, doing that. We have glomerulonephritis. Uh, Mark shared his story. Uh, Mark, as far as I know, you had FSGS as a cause, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis as a cause of a kidney disease? Yes, Doc. Okay. And it's, 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 it's one of the diseases that affects the glomerulus. It's actually uh, still a rare disease, but, uh, but, but when you look at, at, at glomerulonephritis, it's one of the more common causes of, of patients ending up and drugs and medications are important and there's a whole bunch of other reasons. So this is the causes of chronic kidney disease. Now, when, when you look at, at chronic kidney disease, and this is as opposed to acute, you know, somebody's in acute decline, but when you look at chronic kidney disease, you should know your GFR. And that is important because it's gonna put you in one of these five stages and the management in these stages is different. Stage five is what we call kidney failure. These patients will need dialysis or transplant, but there's entire, and things change a bit. Uh, for example, you will take more protein when you're on dialysis, but less protein in early stages. So knowing your stage is very important. When you go to speak to your dietitian or any physician, you should know your GFR, what, what is your GFR, and that will really dictate. The other thing that you should know is how much protein are you spilling in your urine? That is, and albumin is a kind of protein. So, so when some people get confused that, that, that they're checking albumin or their protein, Albumin is a kind of protein, so that's that, but it's a more specific kind of protein that we as nephrologists check uh, quite often. Now, this uh, initiative was, was passed by the president in 2019, and, and, the, and the reason for this was that kidney health needs help. Um, we had a lot of patients who actually had kidney disease and they were advancing, and, and we need to do intervention, and this is the whole purpose uh, of this initiative. And what were the main goals? Number one is to, if you do have chronic kidney disease, to slow down the progression. And we'll be going with some of those things that you can do. Second thing is, if you are getting close to dialysis, then you should be on home, unless there's a good reason that you're not doing home dialysis. UCLA is a very big proponent of home dialysis in our patient population. You know, in my, about 50 to 60% of my patients who are on dialysis are on home. So if you're not on home dialysis, you should ask a question. The national average is only 10 to 12%. UCL is way ahead of the curve. And then kidney transplantation. Um, that's the best option for majority of patients with advanced kidney disease. But our goal, as Mark pointed out, and, and he rightly mentioned, if he had all these resources when he was diagnosed with kidney disease, then we want to slow down the progression so you don't end up for needing of dialysis or transplant. But if you do need that, you should have your options available. So these are the three main goals. Now let's talk about slowing down progression. Now, the, to 2021 has been a very exciting year from, from medication's perspective. Being a pharmacologist, um, I try to, you know, like I said, I, I do my best to do lifestyle changes, whether it be diet, exercise, meditation, mindfulness, you know, avoiding unhealthy lifestyles and medications. But at some point you will need medications and this is important. And, and the first one is we will call the RAS inhibitors. This is a class of drug, renin angiotensin aldosterone uh, system inhibitors. And you probably know that ACE inhibitors, ARBs, 20 years ago data came out that this is, and these are front and center for kidney disease. All of our patients should be on these medications unless proven otherwise. 20 years fast forward, SGLT2, sodium glucose co-transport 
uh, to inhibitors. This is a class of drug is, is really on fire right now. They, they are coming up data almost every single day that how these drugs, so the number one cause of poor outcomes in a kidney patient is cardiovascular disease. So when you think of kidney disease, think about cardiovascular disease at the same time. And I always tell my patients, it's not the fact that, that you end up on dialysis. Sometimes you will, you know, you probably have no choice. You have ADPKD, you have a polycystic disease, genetic cause that's causing, but it's also how you end up on dialysis as well. And your cardiovascular system, your plumbing and your heart and your pump are probably the, the most important organs that will define how you do, you know, post dialysis and transplant. So SGLT2 inhibitors is a class of drug that has shown a, tremendous data to slow down progression, both of kidney disease and heart disease, both in diabetic and non-diabetic patients. Now, what's interesting is SGLT2 inhibitors is, is a class of drug that was designed initially for diabetic patients. Now, it's data came out that even in non-diabetic patients, they are very, very effective. So we're going to do a separate session. Stay tuned just on this class of drug, because this is something that all my patients and people who are not my patients, but actually have kidney disease should know. And there's one more class of drug called mineral corticoid receptor antagonist, MRAs. And this is, uh, so whereas SGLT2 is both for diabetic and non-diabetic patients, the MRAs for now at least caught the indication, the drug is phenarinone, caught the indication for diabetic patients. And I was the site uh, principal investigator for this at UCLA. So in a way, this is exciting time. We have new medications, uh, that we can use to help our patients in slowing down kidney disease progression. There are a lot of other studies that are going on too. Mark mentioned, if you're interested in clinical trials, please do reach out to us. And if we can, uh, we will put you on, on the studies. Now, I, I also want to welcome our Network 18 uh, leads over here. I, I know Susan and Anne are um, uh, on this call as well. I want to thank them, number one, for supporting uh, events like this, but also more importantly, working with us um, in, in, as, as a partner with UCLA Health in, in promoting uh, kidney disease awareness and also the right treatment and, and, and management. So thank you, Anne and Susan from, from Network 18 for joining us. I all, all already mentioned uh, we have Alport Syndrome Foundation, Lisa Bonebreak, who's also on this call as well. Now, when you have chronic kidney disease, a lot of complications can happen. And, and I've gone over this slide multiple times, but let's go over them one by one again. The number one is anemia and iron deficiency. I'll be going over that in a bit more detail in my next slide. You have bone and mineral disease, malnutrition, acidosis and electrolytes. So one question that came over here was about the sodium bicarbonate levels, the acid load. We will do a separate program just on acidosis. Both Rebecca and I will be discussing our, our dietitian. But I just want to answer that question that we're asking about sodium bicarbonate. The answer is yes, in majority of kidney disease patients, especially advanced, they have very limited capacity to get rid of the acid load. And we replace that by giving sodium bicarbonate. The short answer is if your doctor is prescribing it based on the on, on the labs, then yes, they should be on, on, on sodium bicarbonate. And I'm more than happy to discuss that after our event directly with the person who asked that question, because I will need more information before I, I give that answer. And then the cardiovascular disease, very, very important, and, and hypertension and high blood pressure. So let's talk about anemia. And, and today's topic is going to be on, on anemia and iron. So what is the connection between anemia, uh, anemia and iron and kidneys? And you know that's a question that we get asked a lot. And, and what's interesting is, and I always mention that kidneys are a very complex organ and that's why they make us so fascinating. And that's one of the reasons I went into nephrology. So among other things, you know, they, they manage acid, base, electrolytes and fluids, but they are also central to anemia. And a lot of people think, what does kidneys have to do with anemia? And the short answer is they are the organs that actually what we call crit meters, they look at, at if the patient is anemic, the hemoglobin is low. And if they're anemic, they produce this hormone called erythropoietin. And this hormone is produced in the kidneys. And you probably heard the name epogen, same thing. It's produced in the kidneys 
and goes and works on the bone marrow to increase what we call erythropoiesis. The, the red blood cells increase. So this is, and before erythropoietin, now we have that recombinant erythropoietin, but before this drug came out, going back to the, the you know, this, the uh, epogen was launched in 1989, but before that, uh, and that was seminal, that changed our management. Before that, the way we treated uh, anemia of kidney disease, uh, was by giving blood transfusions, which all of my patients should know by now that you should really limit the amount of blood because it can really make your transplant very complicated. So if you're needing trans transfusion, you should first of all, make sure that your nephrologist knows about that and don't treat a number. And I think that's, so anyways, erythropoietin works on this. And before erythropoietin came out, the recombinant as a drug, we used to give blood transfusion, anabolic steroids and all that stuff. So we have come a long way. But then the other class of drug is hypoxia inducible factor. This is another exciting. Now, unfortunately, uh, the drug was not approved by FDA this year. It went, we were at UCLA, I was the principal investigator on at least two out of the three uh, drugs that, that were being studied. And FDA asked for more data for this class of drug. So, so the, the first one got put on hold for now at least, the second one should be coming up. Uh, and, and the key thing of there is that it, it does a lot more than just anemia. They also increase iron. And that's going to be our topic for today when Rebecca speaks. Now, iron is a substance that or element that tends to be low in our patients with kidney disease because iron absorption is actually impaired in kidney patients, number one. And so, so you can take a lot of oral iron. It might not just get absorbed. Iron by itself in general is not very well absorbed. So, and now in kidney disease, there are specific hormones and agents uh, that are being released by the body that impairs iron absorption. So that's number one. The other reason the, when iron becomes an issue is that it's kind of sequestered in different organs um, and does not go at the site where it's needed. And what's a site? That's bone marrow. So the, the whole biochemistry of iron is actually impaired in our patients with advanced kidney disease. Just, uh, uh, th this is the week that Nobel prizes are being announced. Hypoxia inducible factor, the research that led to discovery of that was the Nobel prizes were given out in 2019 for that. So this was a huge information. Now, once again, this would have made this year complete if we had gotten a new class of drug to treat anemia, but unfortunately, at this point, FDA said that we need more information uh, before we approve this class of drug. But the other ones, I'm very glad that they are on the market now. So with that, um, it's, it's my real pleasure and honor to introduce our, our next speaker. It's Rebecca Goodrich. Rebecca Goodrich is, is a highly qualified dietitian and she's been working with the Core Kidney Program. She's actually an official ambassador of the Core Kidney Program. And just to let you know, what is an ambassador? So, so for the ambassador, you have to be an official UCLA health volunteer. Uh, so that's, that's the first step. And once they are official UCLA health volunteer, we need to train them so they can speak on behalf of UCLA health as well. So, 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 so when they speak, they, we, we meet with them, we tell them, and our, our mission is to be fair and balanced and only speak on things that have scientific data behind that. And this is specifically coming from food. So we have heme iron and then we have non-heme iron. So heme iron is going to be predominantly your animal-based sources. So things like meat, chicken, uh, turkey, fish, and heme iron is more absorbable than non-heme iron. And non-heme iron is coming from non-meat um, sources. So things like cereals, legumes, uh, nuts, beans, um, things like that. And then to the right of this slide, you'll see just like a little diagram that basically shows um, where iron is absorbed in the gut, as we said, the first and second portion of the small intestine, and then iron where it's stored, right? So we have storage forms such as ferritin, and we also have ways where iron can be transported, which is through transferrin, which I'll speak to you guys a little bit more about in reference to testing for iron deficiency with or without anemia. Okay, so we can go to the next slide. So iron bioavailability. 
So heme iron is more bioavailable than non-heme iron. So with heme iron, about 15% to 35% is more absorbable. And non-heme iron, you're absorbing roughly 2% to 20%. So non-heme iron, it actually provides more iron than heme iron since it's consumed in larger quantities. So vegetables versus meat. So I know we stated previously that um, heme iron coming from meats is more absorbable than non-heme. However, non-heme is consumed in larger quantities, so therefore we're able to really meet our needs. Um, specifically, when we talk about iron inhibitors, and this is very, very important, especially if you're taking an iron supplement, there are a lot of different foods that can actually inhibit iron absorption, and this is where it gets a little tricky, but iron inhibitors include things like phytic acid, which come from nuts, seeds, peanut butter, legumes, and also calcium products, which has been also shown to decrease iron absorption, so coming from our dairy products, so things like yogurt, cheese, milk milk, ice cream, these guys can definitely decrease that absorption of iron. Polyphenols, right? So blueberries, um, herbs, spices, flax seeds, olives, definitely coffee and black tea specifically has been shown to decrease absorption and peptides. So milk, meats, oats, uh, eggs, and soy. And so this is why it's really important. On the bottom of the slide, there's a note that says you want to take your iron supplement with citrus fruits, for example, because when you consume iron or take an iron supplement or even, you know, consuming iron rich foods, you want to pair it with vitamin C, a good vitamin C source, such as let's say orange, because it really enhances that iron absorption. And so taking it together, number one, um, can really ease some of the GI side effects that we see with iron supplements, but two, it can also really enhance the absorption of iron. And it can, you know, as we said earlier, can just be easier on the gut overall. So this slide um, basically shows, you know, what your recommendations are. And I don't have um, everybody's age group on this slide, but if you have any questions or you know specifically want to know what your needs are, you can definitely feel free to reach out to me. Um, these recommendations came from the National Institutes of Health. So again, recommendations vary. Adults store roughly one to three grams of iron in their body. And balance, again, as stated previously, has to do with um, you know, achieving the intake versus output of iron and our bodies always want to maintain a homeostasis um, state, right? We always want to be in balance. So roughly one milligram of iron is lost per day. And so below, for instance, myself, I'm not going to tell you my exact age, even though I was asked that a couple times today, but um, for my age, I should be roughly 18 milligrams per day. And you'll see that, you know, women have a little bit of higher needs, which we'll get into um, compared to men. And that has to do with menses, of course. And so um, females, you know, definitely we're at a higher risk of developing iron deficiency um, and also with chronic kidney disease, which we'll also get into. So iron status. So this is really um, important to note, right? Because when you go to your doctor, sometimes when we do a complete blood count, um, we don't always get certain uh, labs tested. So sometimes just to speak to your physician, um, you know, hey, what do you think about testing for this? Do you think this would be a good addition? So Hopefully this slide is helpful for you just to kind of understand a little bit better what to check for, but it's recommended to review multiple markers instead of just one marker, because this way we're able to really see the whole story. So the first marker, red blood cell size and color, very important. So if we see that those red blood cells are smaller and paler in color, so having more of a, of a lighter pink-ish color compared to a red and full, um, Ferritin. So this is something that you definitely want to test for. This is that storage form of ferritin. And, and when we look at ferritin and transferrin, um, we have what's called acute phase respondents. So sometimes our lab values can be higher. And really what that can mean is that we have lower iron, right? So while, you know, like for instance, transferrin, if we have higher levels of transferrin, we want to make sure that there's no iron deficiency going on and figuring out why is why are my levels too high. And so transferrin is a, is a protein that's bound to iron and it's transported throughout the body. So it's that transportation for iron. And then total iron binding capacity. 
This is the blood's capability to attach itself to iron and move throughout the body. And so, you know, when you look at all these labs, you see that we're not just looking at one or two, but we're looking at a bunch of different lab values. And then from a nutrition standpoint, so I like to look at vitamin B6, B9, which is folate, and B12, cyanocobalamin, um, and B6 is pyridoxine. So I like to personally look at these levels because um, these really help with the formation of iron. And so sometimes when anemia is present, some of these vitamins can actually be lower, especially B12. Um, and also, you know, if you struggle with a GI issue such as inflammatory bowel disease, um, sometimes the absorption is a little bit limited, which is why we wanna test these vitamins as well. So again, it's never just one marker, but we wanna see multiple markers. Okay. So iron deficiency and causes. So why are we having some sort of iron deficiency and what's the cause of it? And also what can we do about it? So anemia as previously stated can be present with or without iron deficiency. When iron stores are depleted and unable to match up to its metabolic demand, which is what we need, we see iron deficiency. Lower intake and or not meeting those nutritional needs as the previous slide from National Institutes of, of Health. Um, when we're not really meeting those needs, we can also um, have that iron deficiency. Excess blood loss, so through the menses or a GI condition as previously stated, such as ulcerative colitis, um, that can also lead to anemia. Um, certain diets, so vegetarian diets and vegan diets. So if we're staying away from foods that have mostly heme sources like those those animal-based sources like meats and chicken and turkey, things like that, um, you know, we tend to be a little bit lower in our iron sources. Um, symptoms. So as previously stated, that shortness of breath, uh, pica. So pica is when you crave um, foods that are not food related, right? So for instance, what does that look like? So craving uh, chalk. Um, I've heard people crave uh, detergent, right? So different things, even clay. Um, so non-nutritious foods, um, you know, are sometimes uh, craved when there's, a, when there's a deficiency present. Weakness, tachycardia, which is um, fast heart rate. Um, and, you know, this definitely can all lead to risk of infections and things like that. Chronic kidney disease. So as Dr. Rostogi previously stated, since kidneys are unable to produce enough of erythropoietin, which is that hormone that helps um, produce red blood cells. So because of, because of this factor, we tend to see lower red blood cell formation and therefore we have an iron deficiency that's present. So a little bit about that. So nutrition for iron deficiency. So this is where we think, okay, what can I do about my nutrition? What, you know, if I'm not taking iron supplements or if I just need to up my intake of iron, what can I do? So there's a lot of things that you can do. Um, all this data was provided from the USDA. And basically I provided some foods that are rich in iron. So some are non-heme sources such as vegetables, which I like to focus mostly on whole plant-based foods for my patients, especially when there's chronic kidney disease that's present. Um, and so I also include heme iron sources. So let's look at some of the non-heme iron sources. So spinach, so about hundred grams of spinach provides 2.7 milligrams of iron, which is 15% of your daily value, which is great, right? And so that's considered a pretty good source. Um, I like to look at the 525 rule. So, you know, really anything around 20 or 25 tends to be a little bit higher in, um, in that nutrient, looking at the daily value. And that's something that we can further explore in the future, but 15% is a, is a good source of iron. Garbanzo beans and other legumes. So if you're consuming about one cup, that will also provide you roughly 2.8 milligrams of iron, which is 16% of your daily value, which is awesome. So that's, that's a pretty good source as well. So bring on the hummus, right? Um, pumpkin seeds. So a quarter cup of pumpkin seeds provides 2.5 milligrams of iron, will also give you 15% of that daily value pretty high. And then look when we compare that to red meat, which is a heme source, about 100 grams, which is three and a half ounces, that actually provides 2.7 milligrams of iron or 15% of your daily value. So we see how when we look at red meat versus all these plant sources, we can get our iron intake from our plant sources. We don't need to always rely on our meats to meet that requirement. And then tofu, which is also another plant-based protein, about 100 grams, which is three and a half ounces, will give you about 
18% of your daily value, which is also very high. So we, we have a lot of options here. I think that's like the, that's the biggest point of this slide. And iron supplementation. So this gets a little tricky because there's a lot of different types of, of uh, supplementation. And personally, myself, I have to be on an iron supplement because I do have anemia. So um, it's really, you know, it, it was really cool creating these slides because it took a lot of uh, research to figure out why is it so confusing? Why are there so many different types of iron, right? And so I hope that this is helpful for you. So number one, always check with your doctor first, right? What's the cause? Why do you need to take an iron supplement? And this actually goes for all supplements. You always, number one, you want to be a little bit cautious, especially with our kidneys. Um, and number two, you know, we want to really understand why is there anemia present so that we're not just putting a Band-Aid over it, right? So we want to figure out what's, what's going on. So that's the first thing. When, we're, when we use to treat um, iron deficiency with or without anemia, you know, we, when there's malabsorption present or when there's any type of blood loss, that's when we know we need a supplement, right? So um, maybe the foods in itself are not gonna help. So maybe we need just a little extra help with our, with our supplement. And if an oral supplementation is not working, then we turn to maybe um, an IV or intravenous um, supplementation. So let's get into the different types of iron. So we have ferrous sulfate, we have ferrous gluconate, we have ferrous fumarate. Um, so these, these guys are usually um, over the counter. You know, you can also have your, you know, your doctor recommend these to you as well. The thing about these types of iron is that they do have higher GI side effects. So things like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation. So if you're gonna take it before your meal, um, you know, make sure that again, you're not consuming you know, milk with it or uh, yogurt with it, because that will counteract that iron. It'll really decrease that absorption. Um, or if you don't take it before a meal, then take it two hours before consuming your medication, because some medications can also interact with that iron. So things like, um, you know, if you're taking a calcium uh, medication, or if there's a medication you're taking that has calcium in it, or a proton pump inhibitor, um, you know, you just want to make sure that there's no interaction with that supplement. And just a, just a note, you want to take um, your iron with a small amount of food if you do have that GI side effect. So as me mentioned previously, if you want to take maybe an orange or another high uh, vitamin C um, food or fruit, um, that will really help with increasing the absorption of iron. And IV iron supplementation, this is if you have difficulties with oral iron or malabsorption as previously discussed, like having gastric bypass or GI condition, um, or even having high hepcidin levels, which has been shown to also correlate with anemia. So iron supplementation. So just kind of reviewing those labs again, remember to not just look at one criteria, you wanna look at the whole story. So monitor your iron levels, transparent saturation, look at total iron binding capacity and ferritin, which is that storage form of iron. And supplementation can stop once iron and transparent levels are within normal range. There's no reason to continue, right? So that's why you want to make sure you're staying on top of that. So your question may be, so then when do I retest my labs after supplementing? So if you're having oral supplementation, you want to test three months um, before the improvements are made in hemoglobin. So after you start supplementing, test those levels three months after. And then IV iron can take up to six weeks to detect improvement. So, you know, just a side note there. So these are my references and, you know, thank you so much for being here with me today. I really hope that, you know, that this is helpful. Um, if you have any questions, you can always find me on my website and I'm always here to help. So thank you. And uh, you can always email us at core kidney at mednet as well. And, and Rebecca will answer those questions on our website and we'll post them. So Rebecca, I, I think there are a few questions coming in and one of them, I'm, I'm glad they were being asked. One was about vitamin C and the other one was about orange juice and potassium. So I think uh, we have to be careful, right? Because um, we want to avoid special vitamin C as well. So this is where knowing your CKD stage is so important. 
because when you have advanced CKD in stage four and five, you actually want to limit the amount of vitamin C you're taking because there are some concerns that vitamin C uh, leads to higher oxalate and, and can actually lead to kidney injury as well. So, so be careful about that and then uh, about potassium as well. So when the question came up, if I have advanced kidney disease, I should not be taking these potassium rich substances. Is there anything else you could recommend? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, it's just a side note that, you know, and, and remember too, that everyone is very different. So, you know, if you have a history of high potassium, I would never suggest you, you know, consume an orange or mango or, you know, other fruits or veggies that are high in, in vitamin C, of course. So, you know, really it's whatever is best for you, anything that you really enjoy. I mean, if you just want to take a small piece of, um, you know, toast, you know, something just kind of easy on the gut. Um, if you want to have a little bit of applesauce, that's fine too. Um, the, the biggest thing here is just really limiting your intake of calcium. If you do consume these iron supplements, because that can counteract it and definitely don't have coffee or black tea, because these guys have really been shown to <clears throat> decrease the absorption of iron. Great, thank you. The, the other question that came up was actually I wanted to welcome, you know, we have a few international attendees as well. And this is Abhilasha from, from India. And uh, one of our questions was, thank you for the information. Would also like to check if calcium supplement and iron supplement can be taken together. Yeah, so that's that's a really great question. So my suggestion is I would not take them together because you know, iron supplementation is so finicky. You know, you you we have to be very cautious with, you know, when we take the when we take that supplement because there are so many inhibitors. And so my suggestion is let's avoid taking those two supplements or, you know, if you have a medication that has calcium in it, let's avoid taking them together because I don't want you know, the iron to the iron absorption to decrease because of that calcium. So I would definitely spread those two apart, maybe wait a couple hours before you take the calcium after you take the iron, I think that could be maybe a little bit better. Great. I also want to welcome our other international uh, attendee is Dr. Kavandi from Iran. So thank you so much for joining. I know it must be really early uh, over there as well. Let me see what, what other questions are, are coming in. So we, we answered the question, if you're in stage five and struggling with high potassium, we discussed that. We discussed vitamin C as well. And spinach has oxalates as well, so that you have to be careful about stones uh, over there. One of the questions that came up is, how is anemia linked to kidney disease not on dialysis? So kidney disease is a spectrum. And when you have kidney disease, you actually have impaired iron absorption as well as impaired erythropoietin production. So it starts actually earlier. So you can get anemic while you actually are not even on, on dialysis. So that was another important question coming in. I did the question that comes up about all the medications. We're going to have a different uh, section uh, just on that. One other question that came in, if you're anemic, you, so the first thing, if you have anemia, so just going back to the labs, let's let's just see, we discussed a lot of labs, but which ones are the key labs over here that, that you should? Okay. So probably the most important one is this one, mm -hmm. the, the hemoglobin. That's that, because it's hematocrit, red blood cell size, but this is what we go by. Um, and and this, is, this is very important. And there's one more here, which I think is, is a combination of the iron binding capacity and serum iron is the iron saturation. So those are the two important labs that we look at. And once your iron is sufficient, uh, your levels are good enough, your B12, you're not deficient B12, you're not deficient, and you're still anemic, then we give erythropoietin back. So there's no point in giving erythropoietin back to you if you're deficient in iron B12 and folate. But once you're that, then, then we give back, that back and could be given subcutaneously, the, one, the route that we actually prefer in patients who are home dialysis, and in, in the clinic and intravenously, which is given for our patients in the in-center hemodialysis. And the question was, is it possible once hemoglobin rises to within normal range that we can stop taking the injections? Or once a patient starts taking EPO, will they have to stay on that indefinitely? The short answer is that if it is because of, of chronic kidney disease 
and the kidney disease is still there and you're not transplanted, then you probably will need to be on at some level of erythropoietin for the rest of your life. Most of the patients are on that. So the short answer is most likely yes. But, but that's why we follow your blood values and treat that accordingly. So if you give erythropoietin and your levels are normalized, then we will follow you till it drops again. And, and then we put them on once a month, every two weeks, depending upon. So with that, Rebecca, thank you very, very much. This was very, very informative. And I know you'll be coming to all our sessions. If there are more questions, please email us. You can visit our website, but also email us so we can post it on our website so um, everybody can learn from that. So with that, I want to thank everybody. I, uh, Mark, any, any uh, final comments before I finish it up? Yes, everybody. Thank you guys for all coming on. Please like and share on Facebook. Um, this is very informative. I always tend to learn a lot when I actually come on these webinars. And, and, and I'm just so blessed and thankful for the Core Kidney team. We're here to help Dr. Rostogi emphasizes and makes sure that we have that hope mentality because we do not want you to feel alone. So thank you so much, Dr. Rostogi, Rebecca, Jim Cunningham, and everyone from the Core Kidney team. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And I just want to thank our, our circle of core, our beans, the brewing beans, our undergraduate superstars that are working to make this, this event work, and especially Rebecca and Dr. Cunningham for their information. One of the questions came up that that um, am I accepting new patients? And the short answer is we are accepting patients at UCLA Health. And as a clinical chief, I'll make sure that you get assigned to the best nephrologist possible, number one. And number two is UCLA is in the community now. So if you're in South Bay, we have outstanding nephrologists in South Bay. If you're in the Valley, there are people in the Valley, Westlake Village. So if you want to be seen by one of my faculty members, please email me at corekidney at mednet. That's the email that we use. If you have any questions about things that were discussed, please email us. Once again, I want to thank everybody for participating. Please be safe. Uh, we have a lot of these webinars posted now on YouTube. We will edit this and post it on that as well. And last but not the least, please don't make any changes in your care till you speak to your healthcare provider. So with that, we're signing off. Thank you very much. And I'll see you next month, November 1st at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Thank you.